if I look back and reflect on what I was being taught in school, I think that I, I would say it's more so indoctrination into the conventional narrative out there that quite honestly, I think makes us fat, sick, weak, tired, and broke. First off, you got to decide who you want to be in this world, but you got to really decide who do you want to be and what kind of life do you want? What is your desired state? What do you value? What are your principles? And maybe the most important question is what are you optimizing for? I don't believe we need a double blind placebo controlled randomized study for every little thing that we do. I think sometimes the best research we can do is to just try carnivore for 30 days. <music> Guys, welcome today. We have with us Caleb Betts, who's from the uh, Great White North up in Canada, <laughs> and it's going to share some interesting information. So, uh, I guess Caleb, why don't you start? Just give us a little bit of your background, if you don't mind. Yeah, it's really tough to know where to start, but I'll try and give the cliff notes. You'll appreciate this, Sean. So, I am a guy who I'm 35 years old. And I was at a point at, at times in my life where, first off, I didn't graduate high school. I was diagnosed with a learning disability, ADHD, and I was prescribed medication that I took for two years. I had six failed business attempts that I really gave a, a good go at. And I woke up every morning and just felt like shit. I just really, really struggled to get out of bed, be motivated to do the things that were required for me to win but I always had that deep desire to win, okay? I always wanted to create a high quality of life. I always wanted to live out my highest potential, but I just really, really struggled and never really felt optimal, okay? I had a, a, a decent amount of ailments, nothing super intense, but a lot of moderately intense ailments, whether they be psychological, I had depression, anxiety, obviously I mentioned the ADHD. I had physiological ailments like chronic ocular migraines that happened very regularly. I thought I had chronic fatigue, I had brain fog, I had eczema, psoriasis, uh, joint pain. So yeah, I just felt like shit really every single day of my life. and. It's really interesting when you live that way, it, it becomes this normal, like you, you almost feel like everyone in society feels that way and, and, and lives like that. And I never really thought too much of it other than that there was something deep inside of me. And I think it maybe came from sports because the mentors and the coaches that I had in sports always made me, conditioned me to believe that you should never settle for mediocrity. So there was something deep inside of me that essentially said, but wait, there's got to be another way. But wait, I got to be able to get to a point where I can just feel optimal. And I tried everything, Sean. I went on this obsessive journey and relentless journey of growth and healing and expansion. And I tried everything. You, I started with Tony Robbins and Jim Rohn and guys like that and started to get pretty motivated by guys like that. And then I started to get into physiological health and optimizing my physiological health. And I read a lot of books on diet and all the way from diet to fitness to regulating circadian rhythm to hormones and just optimizing your biochemistry. And yeah, I, I really decided at that time when I entered into that journey that I just was not going to stop until I felt better and felt optimal. And I actually did a lot of things when it came to diet. I went on Netflix as uh, many people did do and I fell for the propaganda and the indoctrination that's on Netflix. And I think it was Cowspiracy that I watched, the uh, Netflix documentary that made me try out veganism because why not? When you're in that desperate of a situation, try everything. And I lasted almost a year in and I did not feel optimal. I felt pretty good at first. And after about eight or nine months, my health really started to decline. I started to, I was just, I was pale. I was weak, um, tired all the time. My ailments started to come back. And then I remember I was listening to a Joe Rogan episode and it was the one with Jordan Peterson on, and he was talking about his daughter, Michaela, who I know Sean and the transformation that she went through essentially carnivore saved, like literally saved her life. And he, Jordan Peterson was also talking about how uh, it also has really helped him. And I remember how crazy it sounded. It sounded absolutely absurd. It went against everything that I've been conditioned to believe in nutrition. 
And it went against all of the conventional narratives out there. And I thought, you know what? Again, I'm in a desperate situation. Why not? And I went on just a four day journey of eating nothing but beef. And after four days, it was like the light switch went on, Sean. And it was like, this is how I'm supposed to feel. The clarity, the energy, my ailment subsided in three, in four days. You could tell that my ailments were just, it were already subsiding, maybe not in remission, but heavily subsiding. And I haven't looked back. That was about seven years ago. Seven years ago, and although I've experimented with bringing in other foods and doing a, a whole host of other things, carnivore, I think, uh, really saved my life because it was at a pivotal moment of the path that I would have went down if I would have, wouldn't have would have found something that would have made me feel better. Yeah, I think it would have been pretty ugly. So I'll, I'll pause there because I know that's a lot. But Yeah, I, I believe it or not, I've heard it before. <laughs> yeah, so <we're, laughs> yeah, I know you have. Stuff, yeah. <laughs> I know um, you have. I guess, obviously... One of the things you may mention was that illness has become normalized. It is normal to see, particularly as people get older. I mean, got, got by the time, I think by the time you're 40, if you don't have a chronic disease, you're in a minority at this point, in, in, at least in the United States and, and probably Absolutely. soon in Canada. And so, and it's, it's, it's becoming, it's almost as if they are attempting to normalize illness. When you look at the, 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 the way the healthcare system is, that's just normal. And you know, you're supposed to be on all these medications and that's just the way it is. And it's part of living in a modern society. And because you have a longer life expectancy, you just expect to live like to need these medications and stuff. There's a lot of people in similar situations, I'm sure. Did you, I, you, I know you said you try, you run ADHD meds for a little while. Did they help? Obviously, I'm sure when you, I don't know how old you were, but as a kid, and you're like, well, why, why do I have this? Most of the time, they just shrug their shoulders. I don't know. Here, here you go, kid. Take these pills and you know, press on type thing. Is that similar to what you experienced? Or yeah. And by the way, I was also uh, prescribed SSRIs and benzodiazepines that I actually ended up not taking. So essentially, my experience, Sean, was I went to an ADHD specialist uh, from the city that I was from, and he, I'm not even kidding you, barely even acknowledged me when I walked into the room and. He was looking at his computer screen and he had a, a series of questions, probably ranging from about 100 to 200 questions of everything from do you get into car accidents to you, do you have uh, addictive tendencies, you know, stuff like this. And I answered all these questions and at the end he just said, yeah, you have ADHD and he pulled out a prescription pad and he uh, prescribed me Vyvanse, which is uh, I think a newer more popular ADHD medication nowadays, as opposed to Ritalin or something like that. So anyways, I was on those for a couple years. And yeah, look, Sean, I, I would say like, anyone who is struggling with their mental health, their physical health, their energy, depression, anxiety, when you take what is essentially, in my estimation, like one tenth of cocaine, you're, it, it's going to work, right? Like I, I got up, I did a bunch of stuff, my focus was dialed in. And that's what these drugs are, are designed to do. And yeah, I went out and I did a lot of stuff. And certainly I felt like I had a lot more energy and uh, my depression and anxiety were subsided for a little bit. But the problem is, and obviously you would know this just as well as anyone because of your profession, Sean, but like after a while, uh, my body started to essentially adapt and then I just needed essentially more of a, and it became desensitized to the dose I was taking. And then I would sit down with a doctor and say, Hey, some of my symptoms are coming back. And then they would just give me a higher dose. And then you're on this perpetual cycle of what do you do? Do you just keep increasing the dose? And the way I look at it is it's uh, a stimulant, obviously, and essentially the way I look at it is it's like I was borrowing money or sorry, borrowing uh, energy from the future. It was like an energy credit card. So eventually that really caught up to me to where I was feeling like if I wasn't using that medication, I was completely and entirely depleted and my sleep started to get really affected. And yeah, and then eventually my body just really adapted to it. And then my ailments and, and some of the things that weren't ideal were coming back. And I'll never forget when I went off the medication. First off, obviously, disclaimer, if you're on ADHD medication, I'm not a medical doctor. Talk to your medical doctor about if you want to go off of it and you guys can make a comprehensive plan to do. But when I went off of it, and I'll never forget when the medication was finally out of my system, 
I'll never forget the morning that I woke up when the medication essentially was no longer in my system. And I just remember waking up and being like, man, I forgot what it's supposed to feel like waking up in the morning, right? Whereas before when I was on the medication, I would wake up in the morning and my body would just crave and I would feel so depleted and just like shit before I took that pill that essentially I really was just taking at a certain point after a while, I was just taking it to feel normal. At a certain point, my body was so desensitized to it that I didn't even really feel the benefits of it. I was just taking it to not feel like shit. And that to me is similar to what someone will go through with cocaine, which I've had my bouts of doing cocaine and ecstasy and stuff like that. Eventually, you're now just taking it to not feel the depletedness of not being on the medication or the drug as opposed to the benefits of actually being on it. Yeah, it's interesting. So you go through this continuous medication withdrawal cycle. Like when yeah. You're on it. Yes, you see, you see something happens with coffee quite honestly. People yeah. they can't function without their morning coffee because they become addicted to it. I, you know, I'm not going to criticize coffee drinks, but, but it's a similar physiology. But you got to see, you saw Rogan's uh, Peterson podcast and decided to try this four days, felt better. How long did that last? Did you continue it for a period of time or did you just... I don't know what you're currently doing now, but what happened after you felt better? Yeah, so I did continue it because obviously it was uh, a revelation in my life. It was for the first time I, I finally felt, I don't even want to say normal. I felt like I was uh, maybe on a smart drug, <laughs> at least in comparison to where I normally was. So it was like the magic pill without having to take the pill, right? It was something that is ancestrally consistent. It's primal. It's it's what a human is supposed to be doing. So I was just overjoyed by not only the fact that I felt good, but the fact that I didn't have to opt for a pharmaceutical, right? So yeah, I, I kept going. And then fast forward to today, Sean, I, I would love your kind of thoughts on this because I, I think I know uh, pretty well what your diet is. And I think you're pretty uh, stringent on really just sticking to full-blown carnivore. For me, I do miss the the other types of food. I, I miss the vegetable. I understand the reasons why we stay away from plant foods. Obviously, I've done pretty extensive research on that as I've become more carnivore. But I do miss going out and even on, on a Saturday night with friends instead of just eating a steak and, and nothing. But I do miss having some other things on the side. And I've created kind of my own non-negotiables there. Like I avoid seed oils, for example, at all costs. But like tomatoes, I really like tomatoes. So I'm experimenting with having tomatoes come into my diet, some other vegetables, and really see what my body really reacts to. And uh, I've come to the conclusion that I feel best when I am strictly just eating full-blown carnivore, essentially just beef, water, salt. Uh, you could say maybe the lion diet, which Michaela Peterson has, has popularized. And you've been a big part of that as well, too, in, in that type of eating. So, yeah, I, I'm, I would say 90% carnivore and 10% nothing crazy. But I will add in other sorts of vegetables and, and fruits and, and stuff like that. Although I really feel my best when I'm keeping carbohydrates and sugars low. And when I'm in quote unquote keto, I am uh, feeling pretty amazing. So yeah, that's to this day what I still do and I, I plan to do uh, for the rest of my life. And I'm, I've accepted that. Although from a social perspective, it is challenging. I don't know how you find it, Sean, but... Yeah, I don't disagree that obviously you got to make an adaptation socially if you want to go out and, and do those things. I don't go out that much. So it's not a big a deal for me. And usually when I do, I go out to some steakhouse and usually complain because it costs too damn much because I could have made it for the same thing for a third or a quarter of the price typically. But I think what you're saying with regard to, and this is what happens to the vast majority of people that end up doing a carnivore diet and having success with it. They often will stick mostly to carnivore, and then they may add a few things here and there. I personally don't, I never like vegetables. I don't like vegetables, so I don't miss them at all. I could care less if I have another, another, veg, another vegetable in my life. I would have preferred desserts, and, and as I've mentioned, occasionally I will have a piece of cake here and there. And I did a little experiment one week of eating fruit just to play with my cholesterol numbers, and it, it didn't do much to my cholesterol, but I, I didn't feel good. It actually made me feel worse. I'm like, well, I don't, you know, I, I, not that I was ever really like seeking out it to want to eat fruit in the first place, but it just, this doesn't work well for me. So I, I do it works well for me. I guess I'm old enough to where 
you know, yeah, I've, I've eaten probably damn near everything I want to eat in my life, and I've tasted pretty much everything. And the only thing that's new is blue food. It's like Captain Crunch flavored maple syrup, and the only new things they're making these days. It's not like there's going to be new foods that are actually actual food, I don't think. So I, I'm pretty happy. I'm, right now, I'm eating steak and eggs. That's my diet right now. I have steak for breakfast and eggs for dinner. Lately, that'll, that vacillates a little bit throughout the year, depending on my goals. Right now, I'm leaning back down. I got up to about 270 get stronger now i'm gonna i'm gonna shed some of the excess weight and body fat by eating just a little bit less so yeah it's interesting but let me go back to your store because um, a lot of people have heard mine many times sports and businesses you said you had some you said you tried six businesses what, what were you doing what kind of sports were you doing a bit more of your background yeah so i was a basketball player i did play volleyball as well too but mostly primarily very committed to basketball and uh, yeah i i think this is why it's so important look i was a high school dropout and i think the school system sells us a lot of lies i don't think it's all bad but i think that in large part if i look back and reflect on what i was being taught in school i think that yeah, I would say it's more so indoctrination into the conventional narrative out there that quite honestly, I think makes us fat, sick, weak, tired and broke. Okay, so for me, not doing so well in school, although I was told from society because the system that we use to measure success told me that I was a failure, essentially told me that I was a failure by not graduating high school. To me, that was really hard on my psyche because I thought I'm not intelligent. But one thing that was vastly beneficial in school was sports, because sports, I think, teaches you all of the values and the virtues and the principles that are important for winning in life. Right. So sports taught me not only how to practice, but how to practice in a way that actually helps you grow, how to perfectly practice and how to consistently practice how to win, but also how to lose. Because I think one thing winners do really is it's the way they lose. It's how to look at those things as opportunities for growth and how to heal and grow and expand from your losses and your failures. And not just when you win, it taught me how to work with people. It taught me how to communicate. It taught me how to yeah be disciplined, commit, and how to maybe most importantly, not settle for mediocrity, like I said. And I think that's what most people in society do is they settle for mediocrity. And they they essentially are, I, I think we're wired to feel very comfortable to just fall in line. Okay. And nowadays, I think we call that sheep, right? As opposed to a lion, right? Fall in line, because that's just easier. And you will have a way less chance of getting criticized, judged, abandoned, rejected, and shamed if you just do what everyone else out there is doing. And I think maybe what sports taught me to do is speak up and stand out and how that's important to win and be successful in life. Whereas I think school taught me to sit down, shut up and don't do anything. Yeah. When you look at a population, just the law of averages, some people are going to be average. Not everybody can be the top 1% because otherwise they wouldn't be the top 1% if everybody was there. Some of that, but I guess everybody can excel in some area. I'm, you know, I'm a pretty good athlete, but I, I suck at music. I, I'm in the bottom 1% of musicians. I, I start kids singing, my kids tell me, dad, stop. You're hurting our ears. Obviously you can't be good at everything. I don't think that's, that's possible, but let me, so on to, so you've figured out, solved a lot of the health issues you were having. How about, what has that brought you today? Cause you said you failed a number of times now, hopefully you're finding some success. What are you doing these days? Yeah. So I finally had a business that works. I've created a company that really helps people. Essentially our brand name is awake and winning. So what that essentially means is we help awake people win. So first off, I'll break down the word awake. Awake means similar to what we've been talking about, that you're awake to the lies that we're being sold in society, whether it be from our government, our healthcare system, the Western medical establishment, school systems, media, corporations, and it's to be awake to those lies. Think of COVID. There was a lot of lies we were being sold over COVID. It's to be awake to all of that, right? Not just for the sake of being awake, but because you've actually had the critical thinking skills to know the objective truth, right? At least what serves you. So that's the awake part. And then we help people who are awake win, okay, in their life and business. Because look, I again, I'm going to go back to I think that the system is failing us. I look at some people that I know who have like marketing degrees, for example, from a university, and 
I didn't even graduate high school and they come to me for marketing uh, advice. And it's not because I'm better in any way or more intelligent. It's just because I didn't go that route. Okay. I went the alternative route of not going into the system and being indoctrinated and a system that I feel like I said before, doesn't really serve you that I think mostly if you follow it will make you fat, sick, tired, weak, and broke. So what I've done is I've gone an unconventional route and I've built an online company. I've spoke out a lot about all the BS going on on, on social media and have built a, a following and a community. We've built a top 1% podcast globally where we speak out about these stuff and actually like dive into what is the truth, not just being wacko conspiracy theorists, like truly looking at what are those lies? How do we think critically? And how do we come up with the objective truth that's going to actually serve society and serve us as individuals? And then I help people win in life. And that uh, ranges from I help people uh, do the carnivore diet, which I deem to be the ultimate elimination diet. I've, I have a very high batting average, as I know you do as well, uh, for anyone who has ailments uh, ranging from psychological ailments, digestive ailments, autoimmune ailments. When they do carnivore effectively, there's pretty unbelievable results. So we help people with everything from that to regulating circadian rhythm to all the low hanging fruit that we can do to help people get unstuck and actually just start thriving again, instead of just going to their doctor and saying, I feel like shit and seeing them for seven minutes and getting a prescription pad and just getting on this perpetual cycle of being let down by the system or going to a psychiatrist or a psychologist, which there's a place for that. And I'm not saying that they're all bad. There's actually some great ones out there, but my experience has been in the vast majority of those situations. There's a lot of failures for the system to help people get out of the deep, dark places that they're in. I'm curious, you're in Canada, which was particularly, I guess, aggressive with censorship and, and having a podcast. I know there's been some new laws passed with, with the Canadian government about how podcasts are supposed to re report that are more, more restrictive than we have in the U.S., I believe. How has that impacted you? Are you getting a lot of, I don't know, threats or being shut down or demonetized or how does that work up there? Yeah, it's so funny because this is where we have to be careful with the the media because there's the conventional media, like there's the government funded media in Canada, like the CBC, for example, which will absolutely, it's like our CNN. Okay. It just, it just goes with the, the narrative and what's convenient. Um, and then there's the alternative media who takes the different perspective and, and maybe a different side, maybe the more conservative based media. And I, I gotta say that what it feels like to be on the ground as a podcaster, as a business owner, as someone who's online, who says a lot of things that are against the narrative on social media, it feels at least at this time a lot different than what you might see in the news, right? It typically is are always, in my opinion, exacerbated or exaggerated on the in on media and on social media when it comes to censorship and even the podcast bill that's being passed but there is a new bill that's coming out bill c63 or it's not coming out it's trying to be passed in the government trudeau and the liberals are trying to pass bill c63 which is the online harms act which essentially it's nuts it's pretty crazy it would essentially allow the government to fine you put you on house arrest or put you in jail if they deem what you're saying online as hate speech, okay? But here's the thing, why I say it's not as bad on the ground is because these things haven't fully been put into legislation. They, they haven't been passed yet. And we also don't really know what they look like, right? Now, do not get me wrong, Sean, like I am extremely concerned and I'm actually working on getting passports to other countries and I'm actually preparing myself for if it continues to go this way because the writing is on the wall that i am actually going to leave canada and that is something that should be scary enough the fact that i'm even considering that i might not even be able to do my job here in the future and that it might be a risk just because i speak out against the conventional narrative that is scary stuff and that is something i never would have predicted ever so the writing's on the wall i'm extremely concerned but we still haven't really lost our freedom yet to an extent where it's that serious. That's sad when you think you're a political dissident from Canada. It's how the times have changed. You have people fleeing from 
wherever we're being brutally murdered and now we have people thinking about that in, in westernized democracies in a way it's very sad and, and sean one thing we have to understand is like the u.s might actually be the only country that truly has free speech like canada it's not in our we have our charter of rights and freedoms we, it's not in our charter that we have free speech <laughs> like it's really not which is actually a crazy idea and yeah, it's it's trending in a very scary direction. And it's not just in Canada. Canada is one of the worst examples of a, a modern democracy. And what has always been looked at as a very free country, it, it's probably the biggest example of the trajectory that it's on in terms of the infringing on rights and freedoms, authoritarianism, censorship of free speech, and yeah, just progressivism, socialism there's all these dangerous trends that i i really hope don't cross the threshold into really dangerous territory but we're certainly on the precipice yeah i said see i don't know we'll see what I, I know this year i think there's elections in something like 40 some countries 42 i think so, so it's yeah. a big year for elections and we'll see if the if the populace says hey we're tired of this stuff there's obviously a, a large amount of pushback that people don't, don't want to do that. And I talked to a lot of the folks in the same way. And you'd mentioned kind of censorship, and we saw a lot of that during the, during the COVID pandemic. But I see that, like I said, the fact that we, I, I'm out here talking about eating meat as a health food, I, I could see where they could say, you're not allowed to say that anymore. And if you say that, we're going to shut you down. I, I, I see that's within the realm of possibility, which I think would be absolutely tragic because of how many people that are actually getting better because of this. And, and it's something I've been very obviously passionate about. And you also don't know what you do with that. You know, I guess you'd have meetings in town halls or something until they paraded those as well. The other way to look at it too, Sean, is I, I feel like that's just always been in history, I feel like the truth has always been suppressed. There's always been a war on truth from the establishment and the elites, right? And the people who run the show, there's always really, if you look at history, been a war on that. And I feel like we just have to be creative. I think one of the things we should be extremely grateful of is the fact that we have the internet and we have platforms like this, right? Because Sure, if we're on Meta or we're on YouTube or we're on some of these big companies, which let's not make any mistake about it, we don't own our pages on these social media platforms. Like my Instagram account, I don't own that. I can be shut down tomorrow. I've actually lost my account for a week and two days at one point. So I think that what we have to do is we have to be really smart about where we go. And we have to have these alternative platforms. Like Rumble is an example that you know, seems to be, we actually just got on Rumble. It seems to be a pretty good place to, uh, yeah, to just provide an alternative. Elon Musk, I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but him buying Twitter, he might win the Nobel Prize for protecting free speech. It's, you know, like it's, it's a pretty crazy world we live in, but I feel like this has always been the way it's been. And I think we just have to, instead of sitting around and complaining about it, I think not to say that you're doing that at all, but instead of sitting around and complaining about it, which I think a lot of people do, I think we need to just be smart about it and create these different platforms that have people who who own them, who have committed to protecting the ability to say whatever you want. Yeah, it's interesting because obviously Elon Musk arguably one of the richest people on the planet or certainly within the top has tremendous resources and wealth and not too many people can say i'll, I'll spend 44 billion to buy a social media platform just on a, on a whim and even though and, and like I said, very few people are in his position but even he has struggled with trying to maintain or, or protect freedom of speech because the advertisers say guess what we're not going to advertise on your platform we're going to try to we're trying to sabotage you and the, the eu is saying we're not going to let you into the, there's all kinds of, even someone like that. So it's, what am I going to do? I'm a guy that's I'm nowhere near a billionaire. So it's, it's interesting. But I honestly think, and this is the same thing. The message I've had with the carnivore diet is just share it with other people. It's all, it's millions of us little guys that, that can make a difference collectively. And again, it's also, again, when we talk about the people that have a great deal of this is power imbalance, they are dependent upon us giving them money, basically. So you can certainly impact them by collectively saying hey no we're not gonna we're not gonna support what you're doing and so either fix it change it or go out of business so i think that's the power that we we have as a as a collective group it's just a matter of getting people focused and that's why like i said censorship is so important to them because if we can't organize and 
selectively act, then it's easier. To, like, so it's easier to keep us divided than united because that would be a problem, obviously. For, for sure. And I think also one of the things that's happening is we, there is a desensitization to the the speaking out against the conventional narrative. So for example, if you spoke out against COVID or just any of the BS that was going on over the last three to five years, if you did that at the beginning of COVID, it was like a big deal and people were like, oh my gosh, or whatever. But now we see a lot more people who are having the courage to go out and speak out. And Elon Musk is one of them. Elon Musk is not following the conventional narrative, even though he's heavily in the spotlight. And one of the things that I think is happening is Companies are realizing that if you go woke, you go broke. Look at what happened with Bud Light, right? So I think that, yes, obviously he's in a bit of a bind because the advertisers are saying, hey, if don't settle down, we're going to pull our advertising. But I also think that other, I think that's an opportunity for other companies to come in and say, okay, we'll just get it at a cheaper price. And we're not afraid because we've seen companies that go woke, they go broke and they lose money. And we're not afraid to go in there because it is becoming more normalized, right? It's, which I think will continue to, to happen. At least that's the optimistic part of me. Yeah, interesting. Let me just, so as far as you mentioned succeeding and being successful and God, it's funny, I'm, I'm learning Spanish. I'm on this little app and they rank everybody by how much, and I'm, I'm like in first place, but there's somebody like creeping up. I'm pissed. It just pisses me off. So I'm pretty motivated by competition. I've always been my whole life, you know, no matter what it was, whether it was as a surgeon, as anything. So I'm very much in that mindset. But how do you, from going from a sick kid, failed businesses, other issues, how do you find, obviously fixing your health is an important part of that, but there's more than that. Obviously there's a mindset, there's a, uh, a work ethic, there's a, what do you do to, to the things that work for you that might work for other people? Yeah, look, we could do a whole weekend course on this, obviously, but to just really summarize some things and some key takeaways that I think can really help people that really helped me is first off, you got to decide who do you want to be in this world? You got to really decide who do you want to be and what kind of life do you want? What is your desired state? What do you value? What are your principles? And maybe the most important question is what are you optimizing for? That's one of my favorite questions that you can ask is what are you optimizing for? Because so many people don't actually take the time and no shame or judgment. I was right there with them for most of my life. I didn't even take the time to ask myself, what am I optimizing for? What am I trying? What are the buckets I'm trying to fill in my life? Is it physical energy? Is it income and money? Is it impact and meaning and fulfillment? Is it love and connection and community and relationships? Is it freedom? from the establishment and the, the matrix, so to speak, what am I optimizing for business success, career success? Do I want to be the best dad in the entire world? Do I want to be an entrepreneur that makes multi hundreds of millions of dollars or multi millions of dollars or multi six figures? What, or do I want something with balance? Do I want a ton of balance in my life? Do I want to travel? Who do you want to be in this world? And what are your values and your principles? And then I think winning is owning your behavior and making sure that day in and day out that how you make your decisions, where you put your focus, your energy, where your actions are headed and where you're financially investing your money to make sure that all of those things in which you're showing up from day to day are in alignment with who you want to be in this world and what your values and your principles are, right? And I think it really can be that simple. I think there's a lot of coaches out there or people who are trying to help people accomplish their highest potential. And I think a lot of them are telling them that they should, you got to wake up, you got to do cold therapy and you have to then meditate and you got to journal and then you got to read and then you got to sauna and then you got to do this and you got to do that. And then you got to get to your nighttime routine. And I don't really take that approach. I think that what works for other people doesn't work for the next person. Sean, you mentioned that you don't really go out much socially. Right. And for me, I need that. I don't need to go and get wasted and drink a bunch or eat hamburgers and stuff like that. But I do feel like I am best served by going out every once in a while, maybe once a week and connecting with others, going to a social environment. And that really is one of the things that fills my cup. So that's an example of something that may serve one person, but not maybe serve the other person. So I really think it's about the, the biggest mistake that I think people make nowadays, maybe not nowadays, maybe always is that they don't have a clear vision 
of where they want to get to and what their values and principles are. And then they don't own their behavior and look at day to day with based on where I want to be and based on my values and principles, am I showing up every single day in alignment with where I want to get to? And here's the thing. You want to know what I would say is maybe the best advice that I could give people that changed my life is increase your standards for yourself. You know how we always talk about romantic relationship standards? We always talk about standards with who we have for the woman that I want to meet. I have a certain level of standards. Those are important. But what about the standards for yourself? We talk about discipline and motivation so much. I don't even think it's as much about that. I think when you have high standards for yourself, you just, people say like, how do you just eat meat all the time? Because I have standards. I have learned that meat is premium fuel for me. It makes me feel like a fucking superhuman. And that's the standard that I have. So when I go to a dinner party and there's a bunch of donuts and pizza and all that stuff and everyone's engaging and they're drinking alcohol and whatever, they say, how do you refrain from doing that? And it's because I'm a Rolls Royce. That's how I treat my body. So I put premium fuel in my body and I've learned that meat is premium fuel right? So I think it more so comes down to standards. And I think people are worried about willpower and discipline and motivation. I think those things are fleeting. And I think if you rely on those, I really don't think personally, I believe they're a sustainable solution. But I think when you truly believe that you're a premium vehicle, that's just how you treat yourself. And that to me is the highest form of self-love. Yeah, that's a good analogy there. Yeah, treat, yeah I, li- I like that analogy of treating yourself better. And I certainly don't disagree that meat is premium fuel. I think that that is. That's the top thing. That's why I eat it the same way. I'm like, I, I can eat the other stuff. It tastes okay, but, you know, it's not really that good for me. Yeah, fair enough. So what, I guess, obviously you have a, you said you have a successful podcast. And I assume you, you talked about how, providing carnivore diet information to people who are you interacting with and what are you trying to do for them yeah where am i did you say where am i interacting so who and i guess where and who and how yeah i am on instagram is my main everyone's got their main platform instagram is where i show up the most i have my personal page at the kaler bets we also have awaken winning which is our brand and we have a, a, a good page there that, that posts different information, everything ranging from funny and entertaining things to how to wake up and win, essentially. And yeah, and then we have uh, the Awaken Winning podcast where people can come on and we have guests ranging from, uh, we've had Rob Wolf on and we'd love to have you on, Sean, if you want to come on. We, we've had, yeah, I, Grant Cardone was just on. We, we have a lot of different people that come on, different guests to just talk about how to wake up and win things that we've been talking about today. And then you take that in information and, and then look, I, I think the best experiment that we can do is just try it out. I say this just like I've heard you talk about this, I, I believe. And I've heard Rob Wolf talk about this, like carnivore, it sounds like a crazy idea and we can go back and forth about the data and, and the research and all this stuff. But the fact of the reality is, is, as you've pointed out, research can be flawed and it, it's sometimes leaves the consumer even more confused. Right? And, and I also would say my, it's my personal belief that we don't need, and this is why I think that I speak to people who really appreciate this. I don't believe we need a double blind placebo controlled randomized study for every little thing that we do. I think sometimes the best research we can do is to just try carnivore for 30 days. If it's a high risk activity, for sure, like I'm not suggesting that, but something like tweaking your diet, eating more meat, for example, to just see how your body responds. There's a lot of great measures of success. Like how's your waist, how's your visceral fat and how's your body composition being affected? If you're a guy, do you wake up with a heart on in the morning? One, one of the best indicators of being healthy, right? Do you have a sustainable energy through the day or are you consistently tired? Like stuff like that. How are you feeling when you work out? And I think that To me, that sometimes is the best research that we can do. And I say, just try it out for 30 days and and see how your body responds and then go from there and then do more extensive research. Uh, I certainly don't say shy away from a a credible practitioner that can really help you. I'm a big advocate of that. And, but that to me is sometimes the best research we can do. And that's really what we talk a lot about on my social media, on, on Instagram. And we help people navigate through this very difficult world of thriving and, and winning nowadays. I think it's, it can be very tough. 
Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned Grant Cardone because I saw that he had, had announced he was going to be doing a carnivore diet. So I don't know. Yeah, and he was vegan for a while. So I think he's probably gone through the same thing that I went through where he was vegan and he tried it out. And then I think he's probably seeing that it's not serving him. This would be my guess. Uh, I don't want to speak for him. But and yeah, I hope he does try it. And then he'll be the one to tell us how he was impacted by it. Yeah, fair enough. And I think and. And I've made, I've made this point many times when people talk about diets and whether you should try one or not. What are the long-term consequences? I said, we really don't have good data on any diet, truly. It's all observational data, which is worthless in, in many ways. And at, best it, at best, it can help us form a hypothesis, but it doesn't really concre concre concretely prove anything. And you think about all the medications that are on the market, and all of those, pretty much, without, with rare exception, are basically designed for short-term mitigation of symptoms. This is exactly what a carnivore diet is doing for people. And you felt it yourself. It was obvious to you that this is, I feel, you said within three or four days, hey, I feel a hell of a lot better. So yeah, I, I'm always like, why not, why not just try it for a while? And the good news is a lot of people are trying it. A lot of people are trying it. And despite the fact that media is telling them, don't do this, don't even try it. It's awful. How dare we, we've got all, it. honestly, I think that's helping because people, every time now it's don't do it, don't do it. I want to do it because <laughs> you're telling me not to. And I, kind of funny. It, honestly, sometimes I think the worst thing we can do is be preachy about it or dogmatic about it. That's why I really try and say, Hey, I don't care what you put in your mouth. I just, I want you to thrive. I want you to win. And here's what's really helped me and a bunch of others. So give it a try, try it for 30 days, give it a chance. And then just tell me you don't feel the best you've ever felt in your life. And if you don't, I'm open to that, right? Like, I don't really care. And I think that's why people are gravitating toward it is because I think it's way less preachy and dogmatic overall, as opposed to more of the plant-based veganism type community. Yeah, again, there are some people that are very dogmatic and I try oh, for not sure. to be, you know, I try to be, hey, look, this is an option for people and, and not that it's the only way and everybody must do this. I've never come out and said that and I, I never will, honestly. But but yeah, I'm very supportive and this is what I know. I'm, 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 I've got some, some expertise in this sort of thing, so that's why I, if you want to go do a plant-based diet, go, so, go talk to somebody else. Sure they'll, they'll set you up. And, uh, but but this is what I this is what I do. Let me I guess you're so you're up you said you're up in up in BC, but it was Columbia in one a little bit. And how difficult is it to access? Is it expensive? I was up in Whistler, which is a obviously a pricey place. And yeah, I, I went to the local grocery store and it was probably overpriced or tourist prices. And it wasn't that bad. I was looking at the it was like ribeye steaks for I think it was ended up being like know, fifteen bucks a pound or something like which is not too dissimilar to what I pay here. So how, how hard is it to, to eat corn or up, up where you're at? Yeah, like we have incredible <clears throat> uh, beef up here. I'm actually originally from Alberta, which is world-class beef. So I'm used to eating good beef. I'm over in Kelowna in British Columbia, which is more inland from, from Vancouver. It's a little less expensive, but it's also still expensive. But yeah, it's not hard to uh, access good quality meat. It is uh, a little pricey for sure. But I, I also think that there's people like yourself and other kind of leaders in, in the carnivore space that have shown us that it doesn't need to be this super expensive thing, right? You can buy in bulk, you can buy bigger cuts of meat and then cut them into to smaller cuts. You can ground beef even like just if you're really struggling financially, but you want to turn your you know health around. If you're just going full on carnivore, you could just eat ground beef three times a day. And I'm, I'm sorry, that's probably going to be cheaper than eating some sort of like plant-based or, or, or some other type of uh, diet where you have multiple different ingredients and, and whatnot. So yeah, like I, I really don't find it to be too expensive, but I got to be really honest and I, I hope this doesn't come off as pretentious, but I just am totally not a, I don't look at price for, to me, it's a cliche and it's cheesy and i understand that a lot of people are struggling financially right now and i'm empathetic to that but i think for me i've never really looked at price too much because for me this is th th there's nothing more important than the fuel that i put in my body and i think that i'm willing to sacrifice i don't drink on occasion but like very rarely do i drink i don't go out as much like we talked about and spend a bunch of money on restaurant food i just there's so many things because i eat carnivore that i just don't spend a whole lot of money on outside of this so for me i'm just okay if i'm paying a little bit of a premium to get a good cut of steak i'm just okay with it because i just know that it's an investment in my health and i'm probably going to pay a lot less later when it comes to my my health as well too 
Yeah, we got the Kellogg CEO suggesting everybody just eat cereal to save money. And I think obviously, if you cut out all the junk, because you, 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 a lot of people actually save money going carnivore. When it all comes said and done, get rid of the supplements, get rid of the, the medications, get rid of the junk food, get rid of the giant coffees and the junk to spend money. And it turns out it's not that bad. And ground beef, ground beef tastes great. In my view, I, I eat it. I eat steak more, but certainly when I eat ground beef, I don't complain about it. I'm happy to eat it. Okay, we're about out of time, man. I want to just give you a couple seconds to make sure you share, again, the, the little social media and where people can go and, and what you might have to offer for them. Yeah, like, like I said, the the best place to find me and my content is at the Kaler Bets. That's a ta- that's Taylor with a K, so a little bit of a unique name. Bets has two T's. Yeah, and then you can check out the Awaken Winning podcast. And look, if you resonated with anything that I said, and you're either stuck or even in full blown crisis mode or anywhere in between, and you're looking to really up level and wake up and win in your life and follow some of the principles that I've been talking about in this podcast, you can go to the awlife.com. That's the A W Awaken Winning Life.com. And you can get on a, a call with one of our lead coaches. And who knows, we maybe are going to be celebrating one day because you've really up leveled and won in your life like never before so sean i really appreciate you having me on and very honored to to speak with you and thank you yeah i just on i know you alluded to me jump on the pod yeah i'd be happy to so just shoot me an email or something we'll set that up so anyway. yeah that'd be fun that'd be fun Kayler, i really appreciate it thanks man and have a good rest of your day Take yeah care. thank you so much